Section 13 of Your Mind and How to Use It by William Walker Atkinson Chapter 29 The Will The activities of the will comprise the third great class of mental processes. Psychologists always have differed greatly in their conception of just what constitutes these activities. Even today, it is difficult to obtain a dictionary definition of the will that agrees with the best opinion on the subject. The dictionaries adhere to the old classification and conception which regarded the will as that faculty of the mind or soul by which it chooses or decides. But with the growth of the idea that the will acts according to the strongest motive, and that the motive is supplied by the average struck between the desires of the moment, under the supervision of the intellect, the conception of will as the choosing and deciding faculty is passing from favour. In place of the older conception has come the newer one, which holds that the will is primarily concerned with action. It is difficult to place the will in the category of mental processes, but it is generally agreed that it abides in the very centre of the mental being and is closely associated with what is called the ego, or self. The will seems to have at least three general phases. Those are 1. The phase of action, 2. The phase of deliberation, or choice, and 3. The phase of expression in action. In order to understand the will, it is necessary to consider each of these three phases of its activities. 1. Desire. The first phase of will, which is called desire, is in itself somewhat complex. On its lower side it touches, and in fact blends into, feeling and emotion. Its centre consists of a state of tension akin to that of a coiled spring or a cat crouching ready for a spring. On its higher side it touches, penetrates, and blends in to the other phases of the will which we have mentioned. Desire is defined as a feeling, emotion, or excitement of the mind directed toward the attainment, enjoyment, or possession of some object from which pleasure, profit, or gratification is expected. Halleck gives us the following excellent conception of the moving spirit of desire. Desire has for its object something which will bring pleasure, or get rid of pain, immediate or remote, for the individual or for someone in whom he is interested. Aversion, or a striving away from something, is merely the negative aspect of desire. In Halleck's statement, above quoted, we have the explanation of the part played by the intellect in the activities of will. The intellect is able to perceive the relations between present action and future results and is able to point the way toward the suppression of some desires in order that other and better ones may be manifested. It also serves its purposes in regulating the striking of the average between conflicting desires. Without the intervention of the intellect, the temporary desire of the moment would be invariably acted upon without regard to future results or consequences to oneself and others. It also serves to point out the course of action calculated to give the most satisfactory expression of the desire. While it is a fact that the action of will depends almost entirely upon the motive force of desire, it is likewise true that desire may be created, regulated, suppressed, or even killed by the action of the will. The will, by giving or refusing attention to a certain class of desires, may either cause them to grow and wax strong, or else die and fade away. It must be remembered, however, that this use of the will itself springs from another set of desires or feelings. Desire is aroused by feelings or emotions rising from the subconscious planes of the mind and seeking expression and manifestation. We have considered the nature of the feelings and emotions in previous chapters, which should be read in connection with the present one. It should be remembered that the feeling or emotional side of desire arises from either inherited race memories existing as instincts, 
or from the memory of the past experiences of the individual. In some cases, the feeling first manifests in a vague unrest caused by subconscious promptings and excitement. Then the imagination pictures the object of the feeling, or certain memory images connected with it, and the desire thus manifests on the plane of consciousness. The entrance of the desire feeling into consciousness is accompanied by that peculiar tension which marks the second phase of desire. This tension, when sufficiently strong, passes into the third phase of desire, or that in which desire blends into will action. Desire, in this stage, makes a demand upon will for expression and action. From mere feeling and tension of feeling, it becomes a call to action. But before expression and action are given to it, the second phase of will must manifest, at least for a moment. This second phase is that known as deliberation, or the weighing and balancing of desires. 2. Deliberation The second phase of will, known as deliberation, is more than the purely intellectual process which the term would indicate. The intellect plays an important part, it is true, but there is also an almost instinctive and automatic weighing and balancing of desires. There is seldom only one desire presenting its claims upon the will at any particular moment. It is true that occasionally there arises an emotional desire of such dominant power and strength that it crowds out every other claimant at the bar of deliberation. But such instances are rare, and, as a rule, there are a host of rival claimants each insisting upon its rights in the matter at issue. In the man of weak or undeveloped and untrained intellect, the struggle is usually little more than a brief combat between several desires, in which the strongest at the moment wins. But with the development of intellect, new factors arise, and new forces are felt. Moreover, the more complex one's emotional nature, and the greater the development of the higher forms of feeling, the more intense is the struggle of deliberation, or the fight of the desires. We see, in Halleck's definition, that desire has not only the object of bringing pleasure or getting rid of pain for the individual, but that the additional element of the welfare of someone in whom he is interested is added, which element is often the deciding factor. This element, of course, arises from the development and cultivation of one's emotional nature. In the same way, we also see that it is not merely the intermediate welfare of oneself, or those in whom one is interested, that speaks before the bar, but also the more remote welfare. This consideration of future welfare depends upon the intellect and cultivated imagination under its control. Moreover, the trained intellect is able to discover possible greater satisfaction in some course of action other than in the one prompted by the clamouring desire of the moment. This explains why the judgment and action of an intelligent man, as a rule, are far different from those of the unintelligent one, and also why a man of culture tends toward different action from that of the uncultured, and likewise why the man of broad sympathies and high ideals acts in a different way from one of the opposite type. But the principle is ever the same. The feelings manifest in desire. The greatest ultimate satisfaction apparent at the moment is sought, and the strongest set of desires wins the day. Halleck's comment on this point is interesting. He says, Desire is not always proportional to the idea of one's own selfish pleasure. Many persons, after forming an idea of the vast amount of earthly distress, desire to relieve it, and the desire goes out in action, as the benevolent societies in every city testify. Here the individual pleasure is none the less, but it is secondary, coming from the pleasure of others. The desire of the near often raises a stronger desire than the remote. A child frequently prefers a thing immediately if it is only one-tenth as good as something he might have a year hence. A student often desires more the leisure of today than the success of future years. 
Though admonished to study, he wastes his time, and thus loses incomparably greater pleasure when he is tossed to the rear in the struggle for existence. The result of this weighing and balancing of the desire is, or should be, decision and choice, which then passes into action. But many persons seem unable to make up their own mind, and require a push or urge from without before they will act. Others decide, without proper use of the intellect, upon what they call impulse, but which is merely impatience. Some are like the fabled donkey which starved to death when placed at an equal distance between two equally attractive haystacks and was unable to decide towards which to move. Others follow the example of Jep, in the comedy, who, when given a coin with which to buy a piece of soap for his wife, stood on the corner deliberating whether to obey orders or to buy a drink with the money. He wants the drink, but realises that his wife will beat him if he returns without the soap. My stomach says drink, my back says soap, says Jep. But, finally, he remarks, Is not a man's stomach more to him than his back? Yes, says I. The final decision depends upon the striking a balance between the desires, the weighing of desire for and desire against, desire for this or desire for something else. The strength of the several desires depends upon nearness and present interest arising from attention, as applied to the feelings and emotions arising from heredity, environment, experience and education, which constitute character and also upon the degree of intellectual clearness and power in forming correct judgments between the desires. It must be remembered, however, that the intellect appears not as an opponent of the principle of the satisfaction of desire, but merely as an instrument of the ego in determining which course of action will result in the greatest ultimate satisfaction, direct or indirect, present or future. For, at the last, every individual acts so as to bring himself the greatest satisfaction, immediate or future, direct or indirect, either personal or through the welfare of others, as this may appear to him at the particular moment of deliberation. We always act in the direction of that which will greater content our spirit. This will be found to be the spirit of all decisions although the motive is often hidden and difficult to find, even by the individual himself, many of the strongest motives having their origin in the subconscious planes of mentality. 3. Action The third, and final phase of will, is that known as action, the act of volition by which the desire idea is expressed in physical or mental activity. The old conception of the will held that the decisive phase of the will was its characteristic and final phase, ignoring the fact that the very essence or spirit of will is bound up with action. Even those familiar with the newer conception frequently assume that the act of decision is the final phase of will, ignoring the fact that we frequently decide to do a thing and yet may never carry out the intention and decision. The act of willing is not complete unless action is expressed. There must be the manifestation of the motor element or phase of will, else the will process is incomplete. A weakness of this last phase of will affects the entire will and renders its processes ineffective. The world is filled with persons who are able to decide what is best to do and what should be done, but who never actually act upon the decision. The few persons who promptly follow up the decision with vigorous action are those who accomplish the world's work. Without the full manifestation of this third phase of will, the other two phases are useless. Types of Will So far we have considered merely the highest type of will, that which is accompanied by conscious deliberation, in which the intellect takes an active part. In this process, not only do the conflicting feelings push themselves forward with opposing claims for recognition, but the intellect is active in examining the case and offering valuable testimony as to the comparative merits of the various claimants and the effect of certain courses of action upon the individual. There are, however, 
several lower forms of will manifestation which we should briefly consider in passing. Reflex Action The will is moved to action by the reflex activities of the nervous system which have been mentioned in the earlier chapters of this book. In this general type we find unconscious reflex action, such as that manifested when a sleeper is touched and moves away, or when a frog's leg twitches when the nerve end is excited. We also find conscious reflex action, such as that manifested by the winking of the eye, or the performance of habitual physical motion, such as the movement in walking, operating the sewing machine or typewriter, playing the piano, etc. Impulsive Action The will is often moved to action by a dim idea or vague perception of purpose or impulse. The action is almost instinctive, although there is a vague perception of purpose. For instance, we feel an impulse to turn toward the source of a strange sound or sight, or other source of interest or curiosity. Or we may feel an impulse arising from the subconscious plane of our mind, causing a dimly conscious idea of movement or action to relieve the tension. For instance, one may feel a desire to exercise, or to seek fresh air or green fields although he had not been thinking of these things at the time. These impulses arise from a subconscious feeling of fatigue or desire for change, which, added to a fleeting idea, produces the impulse. Unless an impulse is inhibited by the will activities inspired by other desires, habits, ideas or ideals, we act upon it in precisely the same way that a young child or animal does. Hofting says of this type of action, the psychological condition of the impulse is that with a momentary feeling and sensation should be combined a more or less clear idea of something which may augment the pleasure or diminish the pain of the moment. Instinctive Action The will is frequently moved to action by an instinctive stimulus. This form of will activity closely resembles the last mentioned form and often it is impossible to distinguish between the two. The activities of the bee in building its comb and storing its honey, the work of the silkworm and caterpillar in building their resting places, are examples of this form of action. Indeed, even the building of the nest of the bird may be so classed. In these cases there is an intelligent action toward a definite end, but the animal is unconscious of that end. The experiences of the remote ancestors of these creatures recorded their impressions upon the subconscious mind of the species, and they are transmitted, in some way, to all of that species. The nervous system of every living thing is a record cylinder of the experiences of its early ancestors, and these cylinders tend to reproduce these impressions upon appropriate occasions. In preceding chapters, we have shown that even man is under the influence of instinct to a greater extent than he imagines himself to be. End of chapter 29 End of section 13